So I grew up watching a lot of samurai movies, playing Nobunaga's Ambition, stuff like that. So this nation's always been sucking me in for my Warring States period LARP. This nation's been a long-term project for me. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to win games with this nation. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that feel kind of similarly about this nation as I do, and I'll share all the knowledge that I've accumulated over the years about it and see if I can help you along. This nation does have some pretty distinct weaknesses. Uh, for one thing, where are the shields? This is the late ages, even the indies have crossbows. But it does have some key strengths. Uh, you've got really good magic diversity. Even though you're not super strong in any particular path and your paths are kind of scattered, all of these paths are attached to communion. And what that means is that you can cast most of the combat spells in the game if you set yourself up to do so. You also have a built-in way with your national summons to get some death into your nation. If you set up your pretender properly, you can get a lot of death on your nation and in fact become a very strong death nation late in the game. But there's a lot of different directions that you can take this nation. You just got to keep in mind that your early game might be a little bit scuffed and you need a plan for the late game. Well, yeah, I'll crack open this lineup here. Uh, first, you've got, thank God, ninjas. These things jumpstart your expansion considerably. Because your units aren't the strongest at expansion, ninjas help out a lot with the more difficult provinces while you're expanding in the early game. And then, you know, they're assassins. It's always nice to have assassins. Unfortunately, your fort's only recruitment two, as opposed to some other assassin nations that can recruit three assassins a turn. That would be really nice, but you know, you're stuck with two. So it's of course really good to have a decent stack of these when you're going into a war. And what's really cool about this is that they have the scales walls feature. What this means is that if, say, you're sieging a fort, they can enter that fort and assassinate units inside of it. You usually can't do that. You might say you've swallowed somebody and all that's left is their capital and they have a bunch of bullshit inside of it. You just have a bunch of like lightly kitted assassins running into their fort and just assassinating everything before you storm it. Uh, they might not have any leadership left and then they just rout and you're not going to take any losses when capturing the fortress. So just a thought, definitely make use of this when the opportunity arises. It's usually only flying and ethereal assassins that have this trait. Ninjas are just super badass. Uh, these are your two cheap leaders. They both have 60 leadership. Uh, other than that, I don't see too much of a difference between them. Other than this one is slightly more expensive and has more map move. The only reason I'd be going for these is for their leadership, and I tend to not because they can't form lines, which is why this is usually the lowest form of leader that I'll recruit with the 80 leadership. And what is nice about this one is that it's a single recruitment point compared to your daimyo, which is two recruitment points. So even though it does have a really good leadership, and you should definitely use these for your important armies, uh, this one tends to win out a lot of the time just because it's cheaper and doesn't take as much recruitment space. So a lot of times, you know, when I'm nabbing one of these, I'll nab a ninja along with it, which is super nice. Uh, the Kanushi, I've actually gone entire games without recruiting one of these. The only real spot that I see for it is if you are maybe have like really disgustingly blessed sacreds for some reason, enough so that 10 leadership is enough to lead expansion parties in the early game. Other than that, I don't really see much of a purpose in this unit. This guy, however, the Monk of the Fivefold Path, is actually pretty good and is part of what makes the Kanushi irrelevant. Uh, every single one of these is going to have one of these paths. Most of them are useful for something. And that's because you have these National Priest spells that basically they require one H and then one Elemental Path. So every different kind is going to have a different one of these special spells. Uh, some of them are actually really useful, and I'll talk about them later when I open the Mod Inspector. But on top of that, these are also just efficiently costed researchers. So eventually, though they're not as important earlier on, it is really nice to get a stack of these going. This is the Shugenja. It's always going to be at least Earth 1, and these are its randoms. This mage is completely irrelevant. I can't even remember the last time that I recruited one of these. But now we get to your two more important mages. You've got the Onmyoji, who is definitely the most important mage of your nation. He can be recruited in any province with a fort and a lab in it. Unfortunately, he does cost four recruitment points. The reason this mage is so important is that it's always Astro Level 2, always useful right from the get-go, and then it gets these randoms. And I know that might seem a little scattered, but it's pretty much impossible for these to be useless. 
because no matter what, you've got communion slaves, you've got communion masters, and because of these paths, you can cast so many spells. On top of that, they are fortune tellers, so they can help mitigate problems from taking misfortune scales. They can see perfectly in the dark and see invisible units. And to top it all off, they start every single battle with a little ethereal bird that goes and messes with people. Uh, unfortunately, I think this bird is what got them nerfed and got their recruitment points raised, which sucks, as if Jomo needed to be nerfed. But I consider this mage extremely important, and I will actually sometimes cluster three or four forts together just to recruit these. And the Master Shugenjas are also good. They're not quite as good as the Onmyojis. They do have really good cross paths for you. And once again, I know this looks scattered, and you're probably thinking that a lot of times, you know, these mages aren't going to be very good with their randoms. Uh, I did make a chart again just to help you kind of visualize what you're getting from these mages and really it's not there's there's a use for pretty much all of them. So this is what you're getting with the Onmyojis and the Master Shugenjas. And if you actually take a look at these paths, you can see that yeah, all of these mages in general are useful for something. You probably are only going to want maybe one fort constantly recruiting these, whereas you're going to want a bunch recruiting these, especially because they're slow to recruit and you need as many as possible. And literally all of them are extremely useful. But you do need to stack these up for some cross paths and to get up further into some other paths. Something you should note right away is that 9 out of 15 of the Master Shugenjas are going to be good combat support mages. All of these are going to be pretty effective at buffing your units. And when it comes to these three over here, this one can just cast Flaming Arrows, just Phoenix Pyre and then Flaming Arrows. This one can tag along with your Thunderstrike armies made up of your Air Random Onmyojis. And this one, though a little more niche, I mean it is nice that it's a little higher in water for just general utility. But if you're looking to cast Nushis for some reason, uh, you will need you will need this cross path right here. And this just makes you able to do it without boosters. If you're planning on profitizing one of your Master Shugenjas, these two are probably pretty good targets for the special spells that they get. So thing to keep in mind is that your Priest National spells, which you will get on your profit, the Nature one boosts all of your paths for zero fatigue. So taking it on something like this, or on an air 2 is fairly powerful and you'd generally be looking for something along the lines of these right here if you're going that route and this run right here if you give this a water bracelet it can manifest vitriol and you know 2 out of 15 isn't bad just have them research or just give them dwarven hammer and keep them busy most of them are going to be useful in battle in one way or another I just laid this out to help you visualize what your randoms are with these and get a better idea of what you're looking at for cross paths with this nation. And keep in mind that 10% of all of these are going to get another path of magic. So odds are in your favor to not end up with something kind of lame. And do keep in mind that these can be recruited in all highlands and mountains where you have a fort and a lab built, uh, which are pretty easy to find in general. And you definitely don't need as many as the Onmyoji. The Onmyoji is the core of your mage army with this nation by far, it is extremely important. I'll talk about the water stuff after I talk about the terrestrial units. So Jomon's units are kind of famous for being bad, and they kind of are. Their protection isn't great for the late ages, and they don't have a shield, and their encumbrance is kind of high in general, and like their horse doesn't even have two attacks, like this this is just uh, something they use for their lance charge only, and then they swing around with the katana, which is super weird, but well, I'll share my thoughts on them and kind of help you avoid the pitfalls and see where the strengths lie. Uh, first with the Ashigaru, I really only recruit these during expansion. And that's just kind of the sole use of these is in expansion. You get like, you know, 10 to 15 of these in a little pile up front and get some cavalry coming down the side. All right, here you've got your two samurai options. This one hits really hard, but look at this attack skill. And I don't ever actually recruit these for this reason. Uh, and the same goes for these, but these even have a bigger reason that I don't ever recruit them. And that's kind of, you know, take a look at their stats, look at their weapon, look at what it does, and then check this out. Look at this guy's stats. Look at his weapon. Look at what it does. And look at what else he has. And he, you know, he does cost one more gold. 
but you know just just compare these for a second you know like essentially you were spending one more gold to get the same unit with a longbow and if you want this guy to be a katana guy and sometimes i do you just send him to attack and he'll put away his bow and he'll pull out his sword and he'll go forward and chop at stuff so i don't ever recruit either of these two units i just don't see there's just better options this one having just the obvious upgrade with the bow and the bow is actually pretty good it does have a really long range and decent damage and not all archers can then just become decent melee units with acceptable protection and a pretty good melee weapon after they're done firing off their bows so it is it, these these are actually pretty nice you know they're one of the few things in your lineup where you can say all right, all right that's all right and then you've got the three swordsman unit right here and what you want to compare among these really they all kind of do have relevance in certain situations this one has 17 prot and half of its attacks are piercing this one has 17 prot and does the most damage out of the three and this one has 15 prot but has the highest attack value and half the time does piercing damage and also does more damage than the Oban. Each one's a little more expensive than the last. This one costs 12 gold, this one costs 14 gold, and this one costs 15 gold. Generally, I lean toward these two units depending on what I'm facing. This one is kind of just my go-to generic unit. It's also got a bodyguard bonus, which is great. But if I'm going up against high prot, I will lean towards the Aka Oni Samurai just because they have that added pierce damage. But don't sell the Oban short. I mean, its protection is all right and it is it is fairly cheap so it's worthy of your consideration if you don't want to spend quite as much on the aka oni what he doesn't have though is a cool crest or a standard so yeah it's kind of lame so these right here are your two sacred units they are actually fairly different from each other and i'll start with the yamabushi uh, this one is undisciplined and it's got pretty low morale and these are kind of the chief characteristics of it what it does have is ridiculously high attack and a attack that is sometimes piercing now what this one has for the same amount of gold and just about the same amount of resources and recruitment is it is not undisciplined but it always does slashing damage at relatively low attack but really high damage and it has good morale so that's kind of the main differences you want to be looking at between these two units are these worth taking a really disgusting bless on? I mean, of course that's subjective. I don't think so. I think that your points are more valuable elsewhere because in the end, I mean, these units really aren't that good. They have too many weaknesses that you'd want to patch up and not enough strengths to really compound on with a bless. But if you've already got the scales and the paths that you like and you still have some points left over, yeah, they're worthy of consideration, I suppose. I mean, just because they are low upkeep and you'll be recruiting some of these anyway on your capital for that reason you could use them in expansion with a good bless i don't tend to go that route and in messing with it before it's like you know they're still fairly weak to things like projectiles and that's that's rough in the late ages you run into crossbows a lot in the late ages in indies but what is good at expanding is the cavalry. And go thank Lucid for this knowledge, by the way. I had something very different going on for expansion before his little video on it. Compared to these horsies, it's embarrassing enough that I'm not even going to show you. And as far as cavalry goes, these things are kind of dog shit. They don't get a hoof attack like a lot of cavalry do. Their lance charge is kind of low damage. They're just all around. These, just, these things just aren't that impressive. But where they do fit in is in expansion. And I'll go over that later. These things basically open up expansion for you. Because in the end, they are cavalry. They move fast. They hit hard. They have good staying power because they do have fairly decent defense skill. And their protection is completely all right these things are what open up expansion for you so unless you're doing some weird bless thing with these no matter what you're doing if you're doing an awake expander if you're doing some kind of imprisoned or dormant pretender you're going to be using these in your expansion and they're pretty good at it and then we get to your underwater units this is extremely important as jomon to get underwater it is essential even if you don't get underwater you're pretty much playing Jomon with a peg leg and a hook for a hand. You are struggling. And that is because your best mage, your best raider, and your best unit are all underwater. 
and you've got some options for getting underwater. It's, it is doable, especially if you've got lakes inland. Sometimes I'm in by the end of year one, even without an amphibious expander. It all just kind of depends on how lucky you are and to some extent your scales. And of course, you can pretty much force entry into the water by taking certain kinds of awake expanders. But now I'll actually talk about these units. Uh, this is basically your shark mover. You use this to move sharks from underwater out of the water, and then you put them back into the water so that you can move more sharks later. But other than that, you've got to respect this guy. Look, he's got, he's holding this huge metal glaive that does a ton of damage with six arms. You see that? Look real closely. He's got, he's, he's holding this with six arms. And to top it all off, he's a big brain motherfucker that can stare into the deepest mysteries of the universe without going insane. But mainly just a shark mover, mainly just a utility unit. I don't really recruit them for any other reason. However, the Ryujin, this is why you want to get underwater as soon as possible. And when you do get underwater, you want to build a fort there as soon as possible, and a lab, and a temple, and start recruiting these nonstop for the rest of the game. And if you can, get another water province and have that one spamming out Ryujin for the rest of the game. The more of these you have, the better. These things are good at everything. They are great on the battlefield. They are excellent raiders. And look at this map move. These guys can show up to support any army you've got going on anywhere. They can raid just about any province that you want them to. They come pre-packaged with some resistances and spirit sight and flying. Have a second form, which is like the big cool freaking dragon thing. And then, to top it all off, every single time they're in battle, they have a free water gem. So, if, you know, if you don't got anything else to do with these guys or sit on a battlefield, just have them crap out a water elemental and watch it spin. Uh, their randoms are really good. You're always going to get at least two in one of these paths. And occasionally you get one with decent cross paths or even a water four. All of these paths have different uses. Uh, the fire ones can cast acid spells pretty easily. The air and the earth ones are excellent raiders, and the nature ones can do things like put foul vapors wherever you want it, uh, then cast bone melter, that's pretty cool. And they're generally the less interesting out of the paths you have available to you, but they're still really good mages. So this is a huge reason to cannonball into a lake as soon as possible. And if you happen to be playing in a game where there aren't any water nations, uh, yeah, get into the big water, it'll be pretty easy for you to hold it with these units. People are going to have a pretty tough time pushing out of the water if there aren't water nations present. And given that it's LA, it's there aren't exactly a lot of water-heavy nations available. It's like, in a sense, you're one of them. And less because you're a nation that can easily get into the water, and more because Jomon players are so desperate to get into the water that getting in the way of that is kind of like getting between a bear and her cub. They are so desperate to get into that puddle that they will throw away the game and try to bring you down with them if you get in their way. And at the same time, if you let a German player into the water, you then got to deal with Ryujin later and Shark Warriors, which are super good. Uh, they are pretty pricey, but they're very worth it just because of how absolutely excellent these units are. These things have the highest protection in your nation, they have the highest strength, they have the highest hit points, they have two really powerful attacks, including a 25 damage piercing attack. Unfortunately, they are size 4, so you're, this is all you're getting per square. But you gotta take what you can get, and <laughs> you could do a lot worse than these. I've seen these things take on some pretty nasty elite units and do surprisingly well. It is kind of hard to get them in good numbers, and this is why you, generally, you really do want as many water provinces as possible. And it doesn't matter if they're all touching, you know, if... You just, you need to take what you can get. And I actually feel that way about Jomon's land recruitment a lot of times with these Onmyoji. Sometimes I'll just have a little cluster of forts just recruiting Onmyojis because I just, I just need so many of them. And that's that's how it often is with regions too. You look into, look into Jomon's ponds and they've just got all these little forts in there. It's just how it be. Uh, the shrimp soldiers aren't as worth talking about just because they are aquatic. When it does come to aquatic units... They are actually fairly powerful just because of their super high protection. So that is something to keep in mind. If you get into the water and then someone's trying to push you out of the water, use what you have available to you and you won't be too much of a pushover. Rugens are really powerful water mages, so they're really good underwater. And a lot of stuff that's coming down underwater doesn't have great protection. Uh, <clears throat> 
Just hope Atlantis is far away. So before I get into this big long list of summons, I'm going to mention these special national spells that you get. These are the ones that your Monks of the Fivefold Path can cast, as well as any mage that you turn into your prophet will be able to have access to these in whichever paths they have. So first you've got the one on your fire randoms. It works pretty much just like charm except it's really low range. It basically nabs your opponent's units. Uh, I actually don't have too much experience with using this. I tend to use my fire monks of the five hold paths to hold quills and lanterns and just research along with my earth ones. But if you were to try messing with this, you'd probably want maybe advancing cast spells and hope they just, just don't do regular fire magic. I'll actually test this out real quick, hold up. All right, so I've got them on advancing cast spells, and we will see what they do. There we go. They're doing it. So oh, that must be mine now. All right, I think that might be all I got. Yep, so they nabbed me one light cavalry. Uh, was it worth it? You be the judge. But yeah, still probably be handing these my lanterns for some time to come. Uh, the Fear Not sign is actually fairly useful, and that's because this gives air shield at AoE 2 to your units, which is huge because your units are pretty weak against projectiles. And why air random Master Shigenjas are a decent consideration for prophetization, and that's because the area of effect of this increases by 2 for every path of air you are above 1. And Master Shugenjas who are prophetized can cast Teaching Sign and get higher in air. Uh, meditation Sign is actually pretty cool. This removes fatigue. Something that is pretty cool that you can do with your Water Miranda Master of the Fivefold Paths is hand them a Crystal Matrix and have them spam this spell while their script is running. And they'll just sit there wiping fatigue off of your Communion Slaves, at least until your script runs out, and then unfortunately they kind of stop casting this, which pisses me off. So if you were to do something like that, you might want to consider passing them a bow or something like that, but then, you know, it does get kind of expensive in gem investment. But it's just a consideration is that, yeah, you can use this to remove fatigue in communions. Yeah, but otherwise, you know, your Monks of the Fivefold Paths are pretty good Frozen Heart spammers, so it's not like they are useless otherwise. Uh, Earth Touching Sign is a somewhat low range kill spell that only works against demons. So it's pretty niche. I mean, where that does come up, yeah, it's it's great, but you know, you're the one who's gonna be summoning a lot of demons depending on how the game goes. And then teaching sign, this is a big one. Uh, all of your nature random monks of the fivefold path are effectively nature two mages because of this. Casting this increases your magic paths by one. It's not gonna increase your priest path, unfortunately, the way that a communion does, but it will increase the nature path. So keep in mind that your nature random monks of the fivefold path aren't really one end, they are two end. And also keep this in mind when you are picking your prophet, because all of your master shugenjas are at least one nature. And if they're able to cast this, then it's gonna boost all their other paths as well. So because of this spell, there's a pretty good argument for prophetizing a master shugenja. So first thing I'm gonna talk about these oni, just to get them out of the way, uh, none of these are really worth summoning in my opinion. Uh, they all do have a second ethereal form, which is pretty cool, but really these things just don't perform well. And for their gem costs, it's just, it's not worth it. Uh, these ones are at least really cool though, you know, cause they hug a bunch of flames and then spit poison. It's you know, I, I love I love this as a unit. It's just not very it's not very dependable. And then I'll talk about these real quick. These are your commander summons. These actually aren't too terrible. Their costs really aren't that bad, and they do make effective raiders with minimal gear. I actually think that this one is particularly worth summoning for its leadership abilities and its inspirational bonus. This is a really nice upkeep-free alternative to your daimyo. So keep this one in mind. And this one is actually fairly good at raiding because of its fear aura. Though you do have plenty of options for raiding and it's not really a good use of your death gems. It's just, you know, it's there. He's got a Bane Blade, that's pretty cool. You know, you could, you could use this to counter certain forms of thugs. Now, all of these are ethereal. And this one I don't see as notable. It does have A2, but that's kind of about it. It's just not as good of a leader as this one. And it's also, you know, it costs pearls. So I do consider this to be worth 
the eight earth gems in limited numbers for their leadership. This is an excellent leader. And also do remember this one has a pretty high undead leadership value if you're doing something wonky and you need that. And now with those out of the way, I'll just kind of talk about summons kind of going up the levels from level one. So at Conjuration one, you've got Kappas and you get three of them for three water gems. These are actually potentially extremely important to you. These are what have broken me into water many times as Joman. Sometimes if I get a lucky random, I'm able to break into water before year one just using Kappas and some Shambler skin armor on a commander. They're not the best units, but they do have decent protection and they're beefy little bastards underwater with their two attacks. And I found these to be pretty reliable toward that end. If you're not starting with an Amphibious Awake expander as Jomon and Rutaro doesn't show up too early, Rutaro is your hero that can lead units underwater. Yeah, you're probably going to be taking a Water Shugenja out pretty early, looking for magic sites, making some Shambler skin armor, and bringing some Kappas underwater. It's just, it's how it goes, you know? You need to do it. Uh, your Karasa Tengus, which you get at three apiece for three nature gems, which is okay, are low protection flying units that have a single lightning strike attack. And I have a demo with this. I mean, it's all right. It's, it's really not that good. But the fact that you can get them for nature gems is pretty cool. Nature gems are generally one of the easier things to get a hold of as this nation, but I also don't ever really tend to summon these. At Conjuration 3, you've got the Konoha Tengu. If you compare it side by side to the Karasa Tengu, you'll notice it's actually kind of worse. What makes this one a little different is that it's more efficient to summon, but unfortunately you gotta use air gems to summon it. And I think air gems are more important for you in other areas, uh, particularly owl quills. So I don't really consider these on the menu. The Okami, however, are, they're actually pretty good. Note that they're not undisciplined, even though they're animals. And what you should kind of look at these like, like take, take a look at their stats. They're actually pretty good. And they do have seven protection and 12 MR, which is pretty decent for an animal. These things are kind of, on the battlefield, they're kind of like bad cavalry, and their combat speed is really good. And in high magic provinces, it's even better. These stats get better. So this is actually a pretty solid unit. This is really fast. So these things are really good on attack rear commands, especially if you can give them a couple buffs beforehand. Uh, unfortunately, it is kind of difficult to get hold of stealthy leaders on this nation. You do have Call of the Wild, which will get you a stealthy werewolf leader at Conjuration 3, but I don't, I don't really think it's worth summoning. I don't think it's worth the nature gems, but it would be kind of cool. Because these would be pretty good as stealthy raiders against Light PD. They do a good job. Uh, the Tigers, however, I'm not too impressed with. Uh, they're, you know, they're undisciplined. They do have more attacks than the Okami, but they're not as efficient to summon, and they're just not as good. But the Bakeneko is actually one of the most important summons for your nation. Half of these are Death 1, and they come so early in the Conjuration Tree. Only Conjuration 3, and only at 8 Nature Gems. So when you hit Conjuration three yeah you should absolutely summon these till you've got three or four little death randoms running around searching everywhere you've got for death sites and the fire randoms you get i mean they can research you can kind of think of them as being like an expensive nature owl quill i suppose uh they have this shape changer ability where they just kind of like stand up on their hind legs and i guess it makes them stealthier because they're not you know they're not tat tatting on their four legs only two legs so they get a little bit quieter. But this one does have full item slots, which is, I guess, mildly worth mentioning because of their paths. At Conjuration 4, you've got the Jigami for 10 nature gems, and that's going to net you a nature 2 mage. You can kind of decide if that's worth it or not. I mean, you do have such a ridiculous access to nature 2 mages on this nation. Uh, but what this does give you is a supply bonus. So, you know, if you're thinking about making, say, some bags of wine, I mean, consider these because they're also mages, I suppose. So at Conjuration 5, you've actually got a fair amount going on, uh, the least of which probably being the Mori no Kami. This at 21 nature gems nets you a nature 2 mage that when it's in a forest is an earth 1 nature 3. He does have a bow which is kind of cool. You don't see a lot of mages holding bows but you know I've never summoned one of these so I guess that kind of shows you what I think about it. Uh, the Mujina however I have summoned and that's because these are ridiculously good assassins. Now you've already got access to ninjas. You don't need these. I just really appreciate them for their effectiveness in assassination. Chiefly because they are pretty high in nature and can efficiently cast Swarm. They have a good patience stat and can knock off some bodyguards. 
They have fear, so if it does come to blows, they are pretty effective in that category. And they have a little path in earth, so they can even buff themselves if need be. So, you know, it is a decent amount of gems to invest in an assassin, but this is a very effective assassin. This is something to consider if your ninjas are just bouncing off of someone's mages. Take a Mujina over, you know, just sneak a little raccoon into their fort. The uh, Dai Tengu, really powerful air mage. Uh, it is pretty pricey at 55 air gems. It still is probably worth casting this at least once a game though, just to have that high flying earth access where you need it, when you need it. Uh, he also comes with a pretty big retinue of the Cross the Tengus, as well as these Tengu warriors, which are basically like the Kohana Tengus, but they actually wear some decent armor. All of these huck that lightning strike attack. Unfortunately, it is only one ammunition. You, know, you can't complain too much, though I wouldn't mind if this was just cheaper and didn't come with the bullshit. But yeah, this is a lot of air gems, and you don't need this for battle magic. Because your own Myojis can cast just about any air combat spell in the game. This is kind of something that's more like, alright, I need Storm in this province right now, I'm going to move my Daitengu over. It's, it's that kind of thing, you know. And depending on the situation, say you're able to build an elemental staff with a fire and a water cross path, you can hand it to him and then he can forge air boosters and that might help you climb up into some rituals if you're thinking about casting one. Uh, this is the Tanuki at 26 nature gems. He's basically just a stealthy, fat, heretical bastard that increases unrest. His paths aren't that good, it's kind of like just a bootleg master Shugenja, it's not really worth the gems. Uh, Nushi wouldn't be so bad if they weren't homesick at 25 nature gems and you know they turn to the snake which is pretty cool but the homesickness just really kills it you know they can only go so far away from where they were summoned before they start you know just orzen and dying uh, but something you know kind of funny that you can consider with this is all right look at this two water one nature so you don't need death to summon this and then you get death. Uh, but you already get death with your Bakenekos. So, but the point is that you get this cross path. And this is, you know, this is some cheese here. So this spell right here that all Nushis can cast, though it's pretty expensive, can net you this mage, which is actually likely to be at least death too. So this is a really cheesy, really expensive way to start climbing death if you're really desperate. And if this is anything like hidden in sand or hidden underneath, the odds aren't going to be kicked up enormously to get more of these if you cast it in high luck, high magic. But you know, just a little post-it note to put on the refrigerator in your brain. Uh, Kaijin are actually pretty good mages and potentially worth the 25 water gems. Uh, I usually don't summon these. If I'm summoning this in the first place at water three, you know, I probably already have Rugens. It's just like a bootleg Rugen for the net. But he's ethereal, which is kind of cool. I mean, you could use him to counter thug with some gear, but you've, you've got a lot of options for that. But, you know, there might be a time where the net is an important consideration. So at Conjuration 6, you've got the Gozu Mezu. Uh, this summons one of each of these, the Ox Head and the Horse Face, for seven death gems. Uh, these are just units, they're not commanders. Uh, and I mean, they are pretty powerful. Are they worth three and a half death gems a piece? I don't think so. But do consider this Soul Catcher attack that they have on their weapons. If they hit something and it fails the magic resistance check, it basically casts false fetters on them and their defense goes way down so you know these things might be a consideration against certain thugs uh, but that's about it they're just you know there's other things you want to do with your death gems like say summon oni shugos this is a really good dump for your death gems if you're able to have this cross path and this is you know this is a very strong consideration on your pretender right here this is an extremely strong consideration on your pretender i almost consider it essential for playing jomon because this is how you break into death even if you don't get up to die onis you are getting at least the oni shugos which will get you three death after forging a booster but that's really what you're looking for with these. You're looking for the fact that it's two death. Anything else it has is a bonus. You just want that mage. And yes, it is absolutely worth the 20 death gems. At least until you're able to hit Conjuration 8. If you're able to hit Conjuration 8. If you are able to summon one of these, the moment you can summon it, you should. 
you should give it a staff, and then you should send it out sight searching. You need as many death gems as quickly as possible. Uh, this is your Tatsu. It's basically just a big dragon. Uh, most of the randoms suck. Uh, you can technically raid with the nature and air ones. And I mean, you know, they're not that expensive. They're 19 earth gems. I mean, if you think this is cool, it's like, go for it. But I don't, I don't summon these. There's, there's other things I want to do with my earth gems. Kitsune. So the lesser aspects of this is that it's a spy. It's fairly stealthy. Uh, it costs 30 nature gems. What's kind of interesting about this mage is that you can cheese if you're really lucky, you can cheese into higher passive magic with it. And, you know, you obviously can't depend on this. I mean, you also have a chance to just get a nature three with none of these randoms. Uh, you know, so this is not something to count on. It's just kind of funny. You know, you could technically cheese into higher paths with this. Just don't expect to. Uh, Conjuration seven, you've got the Yama no Kami at 28 earth gems. Uh, unfortunately, this thing's paths go down when you leave the province that you summoned it in. So I don't really consider it worth the 28 earth gems. And then you've got the famous Dai Oni. So unfortunately, at least when it comes to turning these into super competence, uh, Ie Yomi kind of blew up your spot. And everyone knows how to counter these now. If Ie Yomi wasn't being a dick, recruiting these off of their capital all the time and throwing them out in all kinds of random ways, people might be a little more surprised by these in Shinuyama and Jomon when they summon them. You might be able to get away with, you know, the whole Soul Vortex Phoenix power thing with these a little bit better. But unfortunately, yeah, Ie Yomi kind of ruined that for you. However, do not forget that these are extremely powerful mages way up in a path that you don't have very much of. This is why you're building Owl Quills and Lightless Lanterns is to get up to these as soon as possible because having high death is extremely important to you because you don't, you, you know, you don't, you're not super strong in late game magic paths as L.A. Joman. You can only climb so high into your astral unless you take it on your pretender and you don't have any blood. There's, just, there, there's no blood unless once again you take it on your pretender. But these guys break you into death in a big way and they along with the Oni generals are why I think that it is almost essential that you have your pretender able to cast these because otherwise you're going to struggle really hard as the game goes on. This is your saving grace. And so you've got to, you don't want to think of them as being, you know, like raiders. You already have really good raiders. You already have Rugens. And you don't really want to think about them as super competence. They're just a little too easy to counter. You want to look at them for their extremely high death magic and their cross paths and what that can do for you on the battlefield and as far as rituals and construction. Uh, here, by the way, real quick, are your heroes. You've got what's basically just a really good free leader. That's all I use him for when he comes in. Uh, I've got Rutaro. Uh, this <laughs> sometimes you get this guy on turn two, and you're just like, yes, because this guy gives water breathing to 20 of your human sized units and you just march him right into a fucking pond and you can start making your regions super great uh sometimes he doesn't come in for a while though and that's unfortunate uh and the red tengu like this is just what i put in the arena that's it what else am i gonna do with him he, he's just completely uninteresting but he's a really fun arena chassis can't tell you how many hours I've spent agonizing over this screen. Jumon doesn't have very many pretender options and there aren't really too many obvious picks. But I do think that there are three kind of main concepts that work with Jomon, and all of them are completely viable. I'd say that your play style and the kind of game that you're joining will go more into deciding which one of these routes to take with Jomon. The first being Rainbow to forge boosters and get you higher into the magic paths you already do have and to help patch up paths that you don't. Next being Awake Expander, which you're not the strongest nation in the early game by any means. In fact, you're actually kind of vulnerable so having an awake expander can help keep other people off of your back and it'll also ensure that you get into the water if you take an amphibious awake expander and you've got several options for that and the next being scales an idea with scales jomon is that you use diplomacy to cover some of the weaknesses with your nation and be able to get through some wars in the early and mid game and all the while take the fact that you are an extremely good nation at researching and use that to your advantage and then boom out later on in the game with big stacks of Onmyojis and Ryujins and potentially Dionis. The only kind of strategy that I don't think is really a good idea with this nation is any kind of blessed strategy. 
I just don't think you have the units or the mages to support that. But that doesn't mean that tacking on a bless can't be bad. So first I'll talk about rainbow for a bit. I mean, this is probably your better option with the Onmyo Hakase just because of how cheap he is and he starts in a pretty important path already. You do of course have the Frost Father for its efficiency for like a pure rainbow. And the Freak Lord actually isn't bad if you're doing some weird blood thing. You also do have the Demi-Lich if you're doing, you know, like limited paths. But I'll talk about the paths that at least kind of stand out to me. Uh, for one thing, getting four Astral on a human full slotted chassis is not a bad idea because this will let you climb high into Astral, which you can't really do very easily otherwise. And there is, of course, the Death and Fire cross pass. This cross pass is going to guarantee that you at least can get into Onishugos and eventually Dionys. So it's a really important consideration in our nation. Also, just taking four Death in general ensures that you can get higher into Death. Another consideration is that if you're to take at least three Fire, because you'll be able to forge Skull of Fires and then Fire Helms on top of that. And then also with a couple points of water, you could even do elemental stabs and that can secure you higher into quite a few paths actually including air and earth because you already do have air threes on your nation if you're already determined to get to Dionys is also going to allow you to grab the king of bane fires when you get up there and blood is a heavy consideration too because you don't really have an easy way to get into this if you don't take it on your pretender and if you are going this route, consider your cross paths and what can be summoned with them. But this is the late ages, and kind of like the early ages, there are a lot of pretty powerful blood nations out there. And if you're in a game with them, you're likely going to they're likely going to get to unique blood summons before you ever do. But these are, I think, the higher priority paths that you would be considering. And also worth considering is if you don't go too crazy with your paths, uh, you could manage to get one of these dormant, and that would be a huge help to you. So when it comes to taking in a weak expansion build, you've got a few options, and I'll talk about some of the sillier ones first. Uh, <laughs> the Celestial Carp is amphibious, and he has Gift of Water Breathing. And look at this, he can grab and swallow people. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, he's also got a really big, soft belly to cut open. I mean, to be fair, if you just really like this chassis, and I wouldn't blame you because this guy is super cool, he can carry people underwater. And I'm here to talk about awake expanders, but you could actually take this guy dormant as well, and that can help you get into a lake or something, kind of be, you know, like a measure to make sure that you get into the water. So this is open to you, and he's, you know, he's got good slots, he can only wear crowns, can't wear full helmets, uh, but he's he does have astral, and that's not a bad thing. I have seen people use this as an awake expander, I think it's pretty much just purely a flavor pick because it's just not as effective as some other options you have in the Dominion 2 category at expansion but it does have full slots and that is something to consider which is going to give it a little more longevity in value uh, getting a little closer to more realistic options uh, you've got these two dragons right here uh, these things have ridiculous map move which is actually pretty cool if you set these upright you could just fly one of these over to someone's capital in the first few turns it would be kind of funny though more likely the uh, PD on their capital would cut it up because these things aren't that great you know they only have 17 protection so you got to be really careful if you're using these as awake expanders but they do have water breathing and that is mainly you know what you're looking for with an awake expander is the ability to get into the water it's not as much about needing an awake expander to be able to expand in the first place with Jomon. you can you can expand without an awake expander just fine this is more about just supplementing your expansion and ensuring that you can get into that puddle. I think that between the two of these, that this one is the much better pick. Keep in mind that these do have almost full slots. They are holding something in their miscellaneous slot by default, but they can change into a human, and that human's going to have one higher in pass. And what that actually means is this isn't a uh, this isn't just an astro mage. This is actually an astral air mage. It just has its pass lower when it's in dragon form. And if you were to say take four air four astro with this because of this dragon pearl that boosts astro magic by one, also you know temporary astral gems. When you change this into your human form, you're actually going to have five astral so that's 
kind of cool, you know, it's basically it's just an astral booster. It's in your miscellaneous slot, so it's not like it's really adding to your ability to climb astral, because that's, you know, you used your both your miscellaneous slots to do that already. But it does give you that bonus earlier on, so it's just, just a nice consideration. So this one is a nice pick because it at least stays relevant for a long time, and, you know, and it can kind of guarantee you to have decently high air, and that's kind of nice too. Uh, it's not the best at expansion, it is kind of vulnerable to something, so you do gotta be careful with it, but it works, you know. It, it does a decent job if you pick your targets correctly. It's probably gonna pick up some afflictions. And then, uh, God, I hate the snake. This is, this is one of the most boring options you could possibly take. Uh, it is, you know, it's a good option, even after the nerf. It's just, it's good at amphibious expansion. It just, it does the job well. And I, you know, I think this is a really boring pick. You have all these, like, cool dragons and carps and big old bitches with swords. So lame. But, you know, it does its job. There was a time when you saw these all over the place, and that was because they were really under-costed for what they were. But that is no longer the case, and if you really want reliable awake amphibious expansion there's a really strong argument for the earth serpent because it's the easiest to use in that category and can take on the most different kinds of indie types when it comes to a scale centered build you've got a few options the one that stands out to me personally is of course using the onmyo hakase to pick up some light paths along the way to getting good scales this guy right here if you're just looking for a straight shugo and dioni summoner I mean, he'll get the job done. He's also pretty cool. He comes with an ox head and horse face at the start of every battle. A little pricey, but you know, if, if this is all you're looking for. You know, you can get you can get away with using him if you just really want that extra flavor. Now, I think the Demi Lich is the pretty obvious pick because of how cheap it is, how easy it is to tack on other paths, and the fact that the, one of the main paths that you need is death. And he actually does have a helmet slot, which is great, so you can boost a little bit more than you can with usual mobile chassis. And when it comes to your scales, I'll kind of talk about what I think about each of these in order. So usually with this nation, you tend to get resource capped before you get recruitment capped uh, with most of the things that you'd be recruiting. But in the early game, you are going to be relying on your cavalry to some extent. So taking two order can help with that. And also, you know, you should just generally have at least one anyway, because Sometimes you will get recruitment capped with what you're recruiting. And of course, this is something to consider going neutral with depend if you are taking a more expensive chassis, say with a different strategy. Now, productivity, this is one of those things where I think you really do need three on this nation because of how resource heavy all of your units are that you're going to be making use of throughout the game. Uh, you know, shit shark warrior same goes for three growth three growth is an incredible scale for income as the game goes on you're just going to get more and more gold and that's what you need because you need a lot of gold in this nation for all of your mages uh, when it comes to heat scales do keep in mind that dumping your heat scales like look at how much this influences your income and though you know sometimes it's going to be a little better uh, just do keep in mind that you are hurting your income quite a bit if you are dumping it and I usually do by at least one or two go heat and not cold because if you you go high into cold you are giving people the opportunity to counter you in some pretty nasty ways luck is a pretty easy stat to dump a little bit if you need to uh, but if you are going with a scales build where you take three magic definitely strongly consider three luck because that is going to significantly in influence your gem income you, know, you are going to get a lot more gems with three luck you can put any kind of gem to use with this nation so luck three is actually pretty decent on this nation keep in mind that you can absolutely take some misfortune on this nation you'll be all right luck three would also open up transformation on your master shugenjas if you were looking to save on some of this upkeep and magic three i actually think is pretty important uh if you're taking an awake expander it's kind of hard to get a hold of this unfortunately and i think that this nation benefits hugely from high magic scales for one thing you do have quite a few summons that are magic power which is kind of interesting so if they're in m3 dominion they're going to be stronger it's not really game changing as far as those summons go but the main thing is is that you have such a strong ability to research uh, you know, these things right here will research at 10 in high magic scales. That's great. And with this nation, if you want to have any chance of winning a longer game, you're going to need to 
absolutely spike your research and it's great if you do because at least when it comes to combat spells you can cast almost all of them because your own Myojis enter communions with literally everything and give you access to so much stuff and in the context of a longer game yeah you'll be getting Dionys out and those are going to patch up even more of what you can cast with their death and even good death cross paths. I mean, you can cast Wailing Winds with an air random Dione, just for an example. But if you want to be able to actually make a good use of that, you need to ramp up in your research because you need access to all of these different combat spells. That is an advantage that I think you really do need to press with this nation, is the fact that you have access to almost everything in combat. That is something that not all nations have access to as easily as you do. This here is kind of what I consider to be the bare minimum scales for success with this nation uh, and the next to be considering would be magic after these and then maybe a little bit of order two maybe a little bit of dominion and then consider tanking some heat for some luck and then you're looking at a more pure scales build if you're going that route so I'll quickly go through some pretender builds that I kind of see as viable through different strategies this is a direction you can take sort of a rainbow build with a human chassis, which makes it easier to boost higher into other paths. This guy does come dormant, which is great, along with M3 scales. You are taking some sacrifices in order, which is unfortunate, but you kind of have to to take something dormant like this. So this is an awake expansion option. Keep in mind that in its human form, it's going to have four air and five astral. Uh, these things take a bit of practice to use. So if you're gonna mess around with this, like go take it into a test game and and experiment with expanding with it. See what you can take on, see what you can't. But he does get the job done. Unfortunately, you're sacrificing those magic scales to get something like this. And of course, there is the Earth Serpent. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually, I don't use the Earth Serpent ever. I don't really know what the meta is as far as getting his uh, his Earth Paths and Bless up. But yeah, he'll, he'll do the job. He'll tear through Indies and he'll get you into Ponds. And you, of course, have the Carp who is able to take units underwater. Uh, I've taken him dormant, so it's basically is more like if you are near a pond at the beginning of the game, which is fairly typical on a lot of maps, you will end up kind of near a puddle. You will be able to get into a lot easier than most nations, especially if you take something like this. Oh, uh, when this guy comes in around the end of year one, just take 25 human-sized troops with him and then go into those puddles. He's not very good at expanding by himself. As for scales options, this is just, you know, a pure scales build, straight and simple. That's what this achieves. Nothing too complicated about it. It still is able to break you into death in a longer game, and then you're just going to have incredible scales on top of it. Uh, this one is, it's not perfect scales, and, you know, your dominion's kind of low. You can make some trades, but this one does break you into high astral, as well as secures you into death and has a human chassis, which is fairly important for things like boosters. This right here is, I think some of you will immediately recognize the concept here. This is an all in late game turtle Yomi build. The concept here is to focus on ramping your research as quickly as possible, which you are very capable of doing with this nation. L3, M3 to help generate your gem income as the game goes on because you're gonna need as many gems as you can get, especially in the Death and Nature realm. And then once you've got your more minor research goals hit, you jump straight up all the way into Conjuration, all the way to nine. Along the way, you know, you're getting Dione and Elemental Royalty and things like that, because you already have the added bait of going high up into Conjuration with your Dionys, and then you get to Tarts. So this is typical turn one recruitment for me with Joman. These are going to significantly improve the starting army, and you need all of the ninjas that you can get. Profitizing a Shugenja isn't a terrible idea. I tend to profit this guy because the initial starting army isn't going to be super great, and it really helps to have a profit there dealing out extra damage. Because if you get unlucky with what your surroundings are, your starting army is really going to need all the help it can get. And I would venture to say that this is pretty unlucky with these caves here. This is probably one of the most effective scripts for German expansion, and thanks to Lucid for figuring this out. His video on this is pretty much life hack tier to me. I've been playing Joma in a long time and I've never figured out anything as good as this. If you're gonna want your Ashigarus a little bit above center, 
on attack closest and your cavalry down the back on attack closest so that they meet the enemy at about the same time. This isn't able to handle everything. It can handle a lot of things. You just got to be careful what you run this into. Since you don't have a lot of horsemen yet, you're going to be fairly exposed to projectiles. But well, that's the idea of prophetizing the starting commander. Uh, if you forego ninjas for a turn and get like a Shugenja instead, you will be able to get a fourth cavalry on turn two. So that's something to keep in mind. Sometimes that is enough to make a huge difference. But go after easy targets until you get more horses masked up. Uh, I'll be going after this because there aren't any crossbowmen unlike here. This will be a pretty good target for my second expansion army once I've got more cavalry going. So here's that starting army in action. We at about the same time. Perfect. Uh, yeah, you're going to lose some Ashigarus, especially against this many heavy infantry. You should be able to get at least two to four provinces out of a starting army set up this way, presuming that you're not too screwed. Generally what you're wanting to avoid are crossbowmen, and of course nasty looking provinces like this. Archers are obviously something preferable to not run into, but this one doesn't look too bad because it looks like it's just got militia otherwise. This tells me that this is probably a good direction to go because I have two other options after I've taken this to pick from. And then if there isn't anything good there, I can run this into this province here and then maybe come back to reinforce for more expansion. And you want to get your ninjas working as quickly as possible on crossbow provinces, uh, cavalry provinces, and barbarian provinces. It's also a good idea to use them against really large amounts of tribe. So here's that initial starting army again. Looks like there were a few archers here, which is unfortunate. Ashigarus really don't like archers. See all that damage. And yeah, I kind of went how I was thinking where I would end up turning and going this way. No, it might be able to do this. This would be pretty risky with the numbers. And it seems like this one is fairly low after two scout reports. And here's a ninja taking the province after all of the commanders have been assassinated. So there's no one to lead the Indies and they route. Got that water random Shugenja. I'm immediately going to start sight searching with this. All right, buddy, you got this. Yeah. <laughs> There's that heroic fear. Here's some of the archers from the starting army being used in an expansion army on attack closest. So that instead of firing, they come and build a line with the horsemen and Ashigarus. I actually just decided to start a fort and uh, on that province while recruiting a few militia to supplement the starting army so I could feel more comfortable taking on this. And it worked. A lot of archers. And yeah, it looks like those militia might have been pretty important. They all died. And this is what a typical expansion army is going to look like once I'm out of units from the initial starting army. Got the one-armed ninja again. Oh yeah, you got this, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, shuriken right in the back of the head. And here's this starting army against some cavalry. kind of demonstrate how effective it can be. The only thing that it's really weak against are way too many projectiles. Uh, crossbows will give you quite a bit of attrition. And then of course, barbarians and just ridiculous amounts of heavy cav. Like this looks pretty intimidating to me to expand into. But fortunately for things like this, you've got ninjas. So the one-armed ninja against his toughest opponent yet. Can he do it? Oh. Nope, we have a new armless hero. So the one-armed ninja, as well as I think another ninja, has been avenged. It's a uh, pretty devastating battle with some crystal sorceresses, but I mean, you, know, you kind of got to take these provinces. If not for yourself, to keep them out of someone who they would significantly help. But yeah, I lost almost all of my Ashigars. Meanest, baddest scout alive. Look at that. I don't want nothing to do with him. So it's turn 12, I've got 23 provinces, a little weird because of these caves, like kind of blocking me going in this direction. And I could have gotten some more by just going in directions where there would probably be players in a multiplayer game. But it's going to show you that you don't necessarily need an Awake Expander with Joman. An Awake Expander, of course, could be nice. It is an easier way to get into water, uh, though this isn't a very good map for getting into water for Joman. I've been looking all over for water sites with this guy and it hasn't gotten me anything yet. Sometimes you do get lucky and find water sites while you're expanding or just right away. Oh, that's nice. Uh, this is another consideration for Luck 3 and Magic 3 scales if you are going for an imprisoned build because you are more likely to net some water gems 
in the early game and kappas they can they can expand underwater i've gotten into underwater by the end of year one before on an imprisoned build with jomon and that's just with kappas and shambler skin armor so it absolutely is doable especially on a map with proper lakes like if i was playing on this map in a multiplayer game if there wasn't an underwater nation i would be focusing really hard in this direction uh, i would even go to war with someone who's in my way to get into this pond. Because getting access to Rugens is essential for Jomon. Without Rugens, you are significantly less powerful. What the fuck? Bro. So when it comes to raiding with Rugens, check this out. Oof. This guy could go to just about half of the map. You know, just a standard thug kit. A crown might not really be the best idea because, you know, it just doesn't have as much protection as a, an actual helmet does. It's just that if something goes wrong and they do end up in their second form, they can still wear the crown. But at that point, you know, it probably doesn't matter anyway. Here's an air random Rugen against 30 PD. route. Here's the same air random Rugen against 30 heavy cavalry PD. And here's an earth random Rugen against 30 PD. So you can raid pretty high amounts of PD with the Rugen. So here's that lightning strike in action. And there's some cavalry. Yeah, so take this many units to do minimal damage to some cavalry. Uh, obviously, you know, the bigger army it might do a little more, but it's, it's not very substantial. Still, they're very cool, versatile units. Uh, if you script them in line formation and have them either scripted to none or fire or hold and fire, after they shoot their lightning strike, they will just march forward instead of simply flying to the back. Here's a Tatsu with six gems worth of items against six horse drive PD. And he took a uh, never healing wound just from that. Here's that Tatsu again, 16. Well, that wasn't rear. Uh, close enough. Well, nah. Yeah, I just don't think these are, uh, these really cut it. And Earth's probably the best path on them. But, yep, there he goes. At least they can fly away when they route. Here's a uh, lightly kitted Shura against 16 PD. And a Kenzoku with the same kit against also 16 PD. Here's a Kenzoku against 16 PD with Horse Tribe. Here are the Kuro Oni against 16 PD, in case you were curious. I mean, they are kind of cool, they're just not very good. You got this, Jotaro. Oof. 
big hit. Die! Die! <laughs> Your first mistake was thinking that you were safe next to Water's Edge. Not sure if I should be uh, showing you this. I don't want to break the meta. Some stuff out there is pretty powerful that people haven't figured out yet in Dominions. Uh, 